Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encontrar la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Hello fellow travelers and welcome to this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show I'm your host, Mary Guest, and I'm just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination. Hey, maybe it's even yours, and that's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez, and Alberto is the owner of the La Palapa group of restaurants here. Those are the La Palapa, Puerto Vallarta's oldest restaurant on the famous Los Muertos Beach, and the El Dorado Restaurant and Beach Club right next door. So you can enjoy that fantastic view of the Los Muertos Pier, all lit up at night in beautiful colors, or during the day in its grand splendor, for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, seated with your toes in the sand, right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. This week we're going to meet a couple of digital nomads. That's right. Uh, Sasha and Rachel. They are your grateful gypsies who are going to talk about how you can earn money teaching English online while you're living in paradise. Also, we're going to visit with Neil Gerlowski. Uh, Neil is from the Vallarta Botanical Garden. But before we get to Neil and Rachel and Sasha, let's see what's happening this week in Puerto Vallarta, the 5th of August, 2019. The website for Tile Park PV, Parque de los Azulejos, is back up and running, folks. Uh, I didn't realize this, but it was down for a redesign, and it's back up again, and it looks wonderful. So uh, now is the time that you should actually be planning, making your plans at least, to take part in one of their many workshops that they're going to be having. Uh, That is where you will be doing hands-on tiling over in Tile Park PV, they what they do is they choose a section or, or you know a little you know part, and then a bunch of people get together and they work on it and they complete it. It's all hands on, and what a great way uh, to make your mark in the park. So go to TileParkPV.com, uh, register for a workshop that will coincide with your stay in paradise. And like I said, go ahead and make your mark in the city that you love so much, Uh, Parque de los Azulejos. Make your mark in the park. And uh, Natasha Moraga, we're going to be talking with you this coming October when we kick off season season three of Tile Park PV. Can you believe it? Wow. (laughs) Three years is going to start in October. Pretty cool. Tino Perez from the smallest taqueria in Puerto Vallarta, uh, Taqueria El Banquito. He made the move to a bigger space right next door to his closet of a taqueria uh, where he sells his four tacos dorados de birria for uh, 45 pesos. That's like $2 and a quarter U.S. That's not bad. Uh, He expanded his menu just a little bit. Uh, I have pictures of his new place and his new place is right next door to his old closet there. Uh, Libertad 187. All right. So check it out. Go to the show notes and you can see pictures of uh, Tino's new place. Way to go, Tino. I'm headed your way soon. Can't wait to have your tacos. Uh, It's very quiet this time of year in Puerto Vallarta. And remember you can always uh, do the, um, you can always do that baby turtle release over at Boca de Tomates. Uh, make sure you like their Facebook page at Saving Sea Turtles in Puerto Vallarta, Campamento Tortugo, Boca de Tomates. That's the name of their page. It's a big, big mouthful. If you want to go to uh, the show notes here, you can find that right there. I'll have the link to their Facebook page in the show notes. Make sure that you bring your insect repellent with you, folks. It's that time of year. 
The mosquitoes are vicious this time of year. <laughs> Not just out there, but everywhere. So make sure if you're heading down to Puerto Vallarta, uh, the mosquitoes are out and they're hungry. So, um, you know, stock up. Uh, speaking of stocking up on uh, bug repellent, a visit to the Botanical Garden is always a great place to visit. Uh, there's always wonderful things happening there. It's really green right now this time of year. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, any time of year, it's great to go to the Botanical Garden. They have an office that's right in town over on Basilio Bedillo right now. It's uh, Basilio Bedillo and actually Ignacio Vallarta is, uh, is the street that it's on. It's right in the romantic zone. And so I thought I would stop in and I would visit with uh, Neil Gerlowski uh, from the Botanical Garden to find out what's happening at the garden. Uh, it's been a long time since we visited there. So let's go right now uh, to Ignacio El Vallarta, 399, and let's have a talk with the man himself, Mr. Neil Gerlowski from the Vallarta Botanical Garden. Neil, thanks for coming on the show again today. Thanks for having me, Bert. It's been like almost three years, I mean, since we, uh, we met last time at the Botanical Garden. Time flies. Yeah, it does. So there's a, there's a heck of a lot that's happening and a lot of new stuff. So why don't you fill us all in on what's going on? All right. Well, for us as plant lovers, probably one of the most exciting things is that a plant that we first planted about five or six years ago back in the gardens is now blooming for the first time and that's the magnolia viartensis so a native tree um, right to our region endemic just to the mountains around puerto vallarta and so far we're the only garden in the world and the the only place that one of these trees is growing in cap in, in cultivation in captivity, in captivity <laughs> right <laughs> that's totally cool i remember seeing that and you were very excited when that was just first discovered yeah uh so the, it was discovered i want to say we could check the numbers but uh 2012 by a group of uh researchers from the university of guadalajara's science campus up in uh sapopan and and the the location is uh, in the mountains in the headwaters of the Palo Maria River, so the next watershed uh, north of uh, El Iden, um, which flows out at Mismaloya. So high up in the in the mountains around the height of the oak forest, um, and it was amazing to see these trees for the first time in person and uh, hike through the forest and climb up and, and <laughs> smell these trees, smell these uh, blossoms um, high above the forest floor. But it's a very inaccessible area for most people. Um, even if you knew the exact location and, and had a description of the trail, it's a long, long steep hike, and they're not standard hiking trails. They're, they're trails for people who have cattle and such. Um, but uh, at our garden, anybody could come by and experience them and appreciate them. And uh, the only thing that I will say is a lot of times people say, I didn't see the, I didn't see the bloom. And you've got to spend some time looking around, trying to see the tree from different angles because they're upward facing blooms. But when you catch them, um, they're, they're about the diameter of a hand, a uh, standard adult hand, let's say. Um, and you'll often smell them before you see them. They're, they're that aromatic. Wow. Well, it's no surprise that, you know, no one ever discovered them before because they're kind of hard to get to. And, but you don't have to worry about that. You, gotta go, you can go to the Botanical Garden, and it is there, or they are there. you got some things going, several, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah, so we've got two uh, specimens of that tree growing at the garden. They were first uh, started from seed um, by a local collaborator named Ricardo Borioli. And then, as I said, we planted those about five years back. They were the, some of the first plants in the ground in our conservatory space. So a lot of the conservatory plants are in containers, and this one has roots all the way down into the, into the soil. Um, so that's why there's such mature specimens already. Um, they're around four meters high. Ah, um, cool. And yeah, in fact, we're, we're having to train them with uh, braces and cables so that they don't pop a hole through the conservatory roof. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. That makes sense. Um, all right. So other than the, uh, the tree that bears the name of Puerto Vallarta, what else you got going on over there? 
Well, definitely another exciting thing that's gotten a lot of news coverage lately is for the second year in a row, we're on the top 10 list of USA Today in the category of gardens. Congratulations. Botanical Gardens of North America. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. where'd you finish? Uh, fifth. Yeah. yeah, so Excellent. that's actually down one spot from what? last year. What? We were, hey, we were wait, number four. You guys, you aren't listening to me when I tell you to get on and vote every day, all day. What's wrong with you guys? We could well, have been number four they, if you they, all did that, if you just all listen to me. They're probably listening, but it's stiff competition. <laughs> okay. um, if you look at some of the other gardens on these lists each year, um, they include some of the largest and, and most visited gardens in North America. Um, so to be anywhere on the list at all is exciting yeah. for us. Um, and to be in the top five is uh, more than, than we could ever expect. But I'll say that um, for us in, in Vallarta, we were the only garden in all of Mexico to be nominated which means uh, we made it a matter of national pride and said, hey, a vote for Puerto Vallarta is a vote for Mexico in this case. Um, so it got a lot of coverage, not just here in, in the Bay, um, but throughout the country and probably even abroad. There's probably some folks who voted for their favorite south of the border garden, um, even over their home garden in the States. Well, or I know I did. Okay. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, what else is going on? Um, another exciting thing too, so for, for those who maybe like animals a little bit more than plants, um, we've got military macaw nest boxes, and this ties back into plants too because the, the forests here that normally support these birds, um, they prefer pine trees and only the oldest, most mature pines that start to hollow out um, at the end of their lifespan. Um, so with all the logging that goes in uh, goes on in, in Mexico, especially in the Puerto Vallarta region, uh, most of these trees never reach those kinds of um, sizes and, and or levels die of maturity. Off like that, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. They they're usually earmarked for for lumber long before that time, and so. Uh, it, it's become um, well known to be the uh, bottleneck in the recovery of the military macaws, which are the largest and most colorful parrot in our area. Um, they have lengths up to about 85 centimeters, and they could have wingspans over a meter. Um, so we'll say three feet for those of your listeners who um, <laughs> think in terms of yeah, standard units. Yeah, you Americans out there. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I think that way too sometimes. I'm an expat as well. <laughs> so anyhow, the, these birds are huge. They're uh, very colorful, um, mostly green, but every other color of the rainbow too. Um, so to, to see them um, in flight, especially up close, is quite amazing. Um, but a, a lot of people who are fans of the wildlife are so concerned that um, these birds have been diminishing in numbers for the last um, several decades, and the population in the Vallarta region is just a small fraction, maybe two or three percent of what it once was just a couple of centuries ago, a couple of decades ago. And anyhow, uh, we, we first heard about someone who had cut down one of these trees on a property not far from the garden, and we joined the um, the folks who um, manage that property um, and a couple of other bird guides as well and realized that um, although the host tree was cut down, the hollow trunk was still available and we, we worked with the team to outfit little roofs and floors on that and uh, we are also uh, got some folks from Vallarta Adventures. They provided um, equipment and, and technicians to come out and help us uh, suspend these as, uh, instead of artificial nest boxes, I like to think of them as um, resurrect, resurrected nest boxes because we're using part of the same trunk um, to give these birds a second chance. So when we first got there and saw the tree cut down and cut open and you could see uh, little feathers, it, it was a, a sad thing. It? Yeah, yeah. It, it made us mad. It was a tough experience, but then um, we thought, you know what, why not? Let's, let's try this out um, and just maybe those birds will come back. Of course, a lot of people thought we were nuts. Uh, of course. Yeah, um, and, and other people said, oh. you know, 
the birds won't come back, they're going to be scared away forever, um, or our nest boxes aren't the, the right kind of dimensions for them, and, and many other things. But enough people said, hey, cool, great idea, and you know, keep us posted. Let's know if they come back. And, and so sure enough, they, they have. And now um, the, the place is a Wakamaya sanctuary. You can look it up online, I, I think, uh, Sanctuario El Wakamaya, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Jorge, um, Jorge Novoa and Francisco Espinosa of that project now say that they've got close to 20 artificial nest boxes up and over 20 um, adult birds. Um, uh, and when they right. say over 20, once you get beyond 20 birds, how could you even count and see as they're flying around the sky um, exactly how many you can? It's hard to do a bird census like that. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Uh, wow. So where is this exact? So that's just a couple of miles um, down from the garden, okay. um, and those folks live in Las Juntas y Los Veranos, right in the town center. Right. Um, but the easiest way to view all the birds on their property is to go yourself and you know go online to their website, um, book a tour, and go experience that. Um, and I highly recommend it. But the second best place, probably now, to experience wild macaws um, flying all, all around is at the garden. Um, they're not as close as you could find at that other sanctuary I mentioned, but if you bring some binoculars, you'll, you'll definitely get plenty of great views of them. And we've got uh, two nest boxes on the large pine tree on top of our highest hill. And then there's a, a second uh, pine tree not far from our visitor center that has new and as of yet uninhabited nest boxes, um, but hopefully some more will come there. But the big pine tree on top of our highest hill has uh, couples in both of the nest boxes. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had reports of the first flight of, of the fledglings. Oh, uh, how cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, man, you're going to need to build more condos up there just like that for those guys. We, we gonna will, be, You're yeah. going to biartanize this thing. You can build condos, you know, macaw condos. I love this. Uh-huh, the macaw comeback. Yeah, that's right. One nest box at a time. At a time. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, and so, right. so other people who have properties, um, especially if they're properties with pine forest and in the vicinity of the south of town where this population rebound is happening, uh, Jorge and, and Francisco build the nest boxes, and they'll even install it for you um, at quite a reasonable price considering the opportunity um, to help with the comeback of a species such as this one. Right on. That is so cool. All right, so what else is new? You guys are doing like vanilla, aren't you? Yeah, so we've got um, a vanilla plantation. We've had vanillas in the garden since the very start, but uh, this past summer um, we planted in over 7,000 cuttings. Ooh. Yeah, it, wow. was, it was hard just to get an order that big in. Um, and uh, we put them on posts. Um, the uh, tip of mesquite wood, which is very termite resistant, and they're about the height of a, an average uh, adult um, and, and separated perhaps by about two meters so that the uh, vines won't start to interconnect with each other. It gives enough space so that people can go and hand pollinate them. So vanilla oh, yeah. needs to be hand pollinated, which is a very tedious process. Um, and then also uh, so that they can, the vanilla beans can be harvested uh, afterwards. So it'll still take some time before those reach uh, complete maturity. We probably need about five more years. It's about six years total until we could start harvesting on a large scale. But in the meantime, the vines are thriving. Nice. Um, they're great to, to go out and see. Are they odiferous? Can you smell anything? Or is that a bloom blossom yeah, thing? Yeah, good, good question. It's, it's funny for me, um, knowing that it doesn't have any kind of a, um, odor to it, to the flower itself, um, because I'll see a lot of people go up to the vanilla blossoms, and they blossom in April generally, um, and into May a bit too, and you'll see, see people go right up to them and start sniffing, and then go, ah, and you want to uh, say to yourself, uh, you're a liar, yeah, you're not, you <laughs> you're not thing. smelling yeah, it. That's yeah. right. Hey, how's that um, air smell? Uh -huh. so, but it's the bean itself that, um, uh, of course, has that great aroma and then the amazing taste that we all love so much right all right so what about the opposite how about chocolate 
Chocolate, there's plenty of chocolate at the garden too. We've got both the Criollo and Forestal cultivars of chocolate. So the um, they taste kind of similar, of course. Um, there a lot of the fine artesian chocolate people will say that the uh, Forestal cultivar is the, the better type, and that one's a little bit thinner, more um, very red, almost burgundy color, and more elongated versus the Criollo is more uh, football in shape and matures to about a, a, an orange instead of the, the deep red. Um, but um, both of them um, make incredible chocolate. Uh, we don't have as large of a plantation of them as the as the vanilla plantation, um, but still plenty to to see and experience there. And then this winter we just had a chocolate festival, so we had uh, vendors and um, chocolate makers from all over uh, Mexico, but especially here in the region, um, Puerto Vallarta, and then up into Nayarit, um, bringing their wares, explaining the the processes of of making chocolate. Um, and it was a, a very tasty festival to, I to bet. host. Oh my God, chocolate festival! So, what kind of things in chocolate do you sell? You say you got chocolate bars. You cho- what do you sell? So, there's definitely plenty of chocolate bars at the garden, um, and you would definitely want to check on, you know, working here at, at at our downtown office more more than being up at the garden. I don't remember exactly oh, okay. what we've got on stock lately. Um, but the cho- chocolate bars are a standard, um, and and there's usually a lot of other seasonal products to chocolate butter, et cetera. Okay. All right. Well, good. Well, you know, I'll I'll look that up and I'll uh, you know put a link to it. All right. And Sounds that, great. Just do that. What else is going on? Anything else uh, that's exciting and new? Plenty. You know, I, I like to tell people um, when they say what's new at the garden, just go up and experience it for yourself. Um, as, a, as a garden, there's always something new in bloom or in fruit. And for people who think that Vallarta just has two seasons, dry season and wet season, no. For, for people who are really looking at, at nature, um, every week brings something brand new. And, and for a lot of plants, um, they'll have a, a bloom that lasts 24 hours. And that's it. If you didn't catch it that one day of the year, then you just have to wait until the following. Um, A great time to come up and and visit us um, will especially be this June 22nd. We're celebrating the National uh, Botanical Garden Day, so Dia Nacional de Jardines Botanicos. And we've got a whole bunch of uh, uh, activities lined up from a chocolate making workshop in the morning we also have a site visit to a property that the gardens hopes to acquire. It's got an incredible uh, uh, intact forest, and uh, we'll do a little field trip over there to check it out and botanize a little bit. And a third um, morning activity is a visit to the beehives at the garden. After that, and so that has a separate fee that's uh, additional, but the rest of the day is included with the standard garden admission of 200 pesos, and it includes uh, a very rapid fire type uh, presentation on different pollinators and the animals and, and the plants that they uh, pollinate. So there's, um, let's see here, bats, uh, bees, butterflies even ants, um, and then the connection um, back to the plants. Um, so we'll have experts from each of those just talk for 10 minutes apiece. Um, that's all they have time for. And then they'll do a, a hike, a guided hike out in the garden so that you'll see a lot of these plants that they've just talked about and hopefully in a lot of cases see their pollinators too. Um, after that, we'll have uh, a couple of hours of live music and uh, there'll be a, a workshop for kids for making bee costumes. <laughs> That's so cool. Should make for some good photo ops. <laughs> I should say so. Well, all right. It sounds like there's a whole lot happening um, in, in the garden and uh, you've got um, an office here in town. And so, you know, if you need some information about the garden and you want to talk with Neil, you know, he's right here on I. Vallarta and Basilio Badillo, right? Right. Ignacio L. Vallarta 399, um, just past Basilio Badillo. And from our office here, we're selling the new tour to the garden, which is a guided, curated experience. Um, includes your round-trip transportation from Puerto Vallarta and back at the end of the day, even um, all the way up to Nuevo Vallarta. 
and includes uh, your guide is with you the entire time to entertain, to explain, um, to give history, and to point out a lot of stuff that you'd probably miss if you were just visiting on your own and didn't have someone pointing all that out for you. Um, your lunch is included and up to one alcoholic beverage with that. Um, and your lunch is also a guided, curated experience. And a lot of the same plants that you just saw in cultivation are spread out before you on your plates. And your guide explains um, the ingredients and how these uh, products were prepared. So that's called the Botanical Delights Tour and Culinary Adventure. Um, you could purchase that either at our office downtown or um, online on our website www.vbgardens.org. Excellent. And I'll have the links to that as well in the show notes for this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. I'll have a map that'll drop you right in front of the Vallarta Botanical Garden Place. And, uh, and you know, check it out. That sounds like a great thing. How much is that tour? 2,180 pesos. So the last I checked, about 109 U.S. dollars. Excellent. All right. Well, very good. Uh, Neil, thanks for taking your time and, uh, you know, meeting with me today. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Barry. It's always a pleasure. All right, Neil. Thank you. That was great, right? Great catching up, finding out what's going on at the Botanical Garden. Uh, congratulations to them once again for making it to fifth place overall in the best of the North America Botanical Garden Series contest. Uh, that was great. And thank you all for getting out there and voting. Uh, we'll try again next year, of course. And maybe we can uh, get them up to number four, or maybe number three, or maybe number two, or maybe number one. Who knows? Uh, I have links in the show notes uh, to all of the Vallarta Botanical Garden great suggestions that Neil gave us. Uh, go over there and check them out, and uh, make a reservation if you'd like to go and take one of those rate, you know, one of those great garden tours. Uh, that sounds very wonderful. All right, our next interview is going to be interesting. Um, I'm sure that many of you, if you've been paying attention to my podcast, would know that if you're not Mexican and you don't own a business, uh, then you really can't work legally in Mexico without some sort of permission, without some sort of a permit or a waiver, you know, that kind of a thing that's worked out with employers and, you know, through the government and so forth. So, there are plenty of people, however, that do live in Puerto Vallarta right now who work remotely. They actually have internet businesses, they do tech support, they work, you know, they work from home, kind of, sort of, you know, but home happens to be down in Puerto Vallarta. They, these are deals that a lot of people have set up up in the States uh, to make it possible for them to live and work in Mexico, so to speak. Now, a while back, we spoke with Chase Buckner over at Vallarta Cowork, and we talked about digital nomads. And digital nomads are people that have no roots. Uh, they're nomads. They travel around the world, and they bring their work with them. Uh, all they really need is a good, strong internet connection, and voila, they can make a living from wherever in the world they happen to be. So wouldn't it be wonderful if you, for example, if you wanted to, of course, if you want, could live in Puerto Vallarta or anywhere else in the world for that matter, happens to, of course, it happens to have to have, to have good internet, uh, but you could be living the dream of working wherever you damn pleased, right? That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Well, many of you, I'm sure, would like to know how you can actually make that break from the rat race and become a digital nomad. Uh, so how do you do it? How does it pay? Um, can you survive on that kind of a salary and continue to live the life that you want? What if you're retired, um, making a pension, but you want to supplement that pension so that you can live an even better life in paradise, you know, on the beach, right? Well, these two guests, Rachel and Sasha, they're going to tell you how they do it, and they're going to tell you how you can do it too. Uh, in May, when I was recording interviews in town, I made a point to drop in on a group of digital nomads. They were having a meetup that was organized by a uh, Vallarta Digital Nomad uh, Facebook group. And when I got there, I immediately noticed <laughs> that I was the oldest guy there. Uh, there were lots of young kids there. Uh, no, okay, I'm sorry. 
lots of young adults from all over the world. They were all there. Many of them had very interesting things to say and, you know, talk about, they all talked about what they did in paradise. And out of these nomads, there was a couple. And they told me that they actually help others learn to do the nomad life by teaching English online uh, to Chinese students. So I, I asked them if they'd come on uh, the show, if they would actually come on over to uh, Kelly's Por Favor Saloon and Cookhouse at my uh, the next meet and greet that I had coming up, and then maybe I could int- interview them there, and they agreed. So... <laughs> Uh, let's go right now to Lazaro Cardenas, 245 in the Romantic Zone, on the roof of Kelly's Por Favor Saloon and Cookhouse, and let's meet the Grateful Gypsies themselves. Yes, that's the name of their website, the Grateful Gypsies Rachel and Sasha, who will tell you how to improvise your life and become a digital nomad. Sasha and Rachel, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having us. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, where are you from, and what was your path that led you to Puerto Vallarta? All right, ladies first. All right, ladies first. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I'm from Tennessee originally, and I met Sasha. We're married. We'll just go ahead and get that out of the way. We're married now. But I met him in 2008, right when I first graduated college. Uh-huh. And I'm going to go ahead and make this very long story somewhat short. Um, he moved to China. I was still back in America. We weren't dating, but we kept in really close touch. He came back to America. We started dating. Spent an entire summer seeing music together. Uh, Then couldn't find jobs. This was 2009. So I had a degree in music business. He has a degree in telecommunications, video editing. And in 2009, there were no jobs for us. So he convinced me to go back to China with him. So we went to China to teach English together. And we did that for five years. Then... We lived in Bali for a year, and we did a ton of traveling in between. And then we decided that we wanted more time closer to home, so we came back to the States, and that was when we started teaching English online. We were teaching English in China, then we started teaching English online to Chinese kids. We were in the States, we started to run out of money, so we (laughs) busted down to Mexico, and here we are. Uh, Wow. Wow. All right. She did a pretty good job of telling the very long story in a succinct way <laughs> I should say so that's that's pretty good um, so let's see what I missed out yeah, on there uh, so I'm actually I'm from Michigan grew up uh, outside of Detroit for the most part and went to school at Michigan State go green and then after college yeah I couldn't uh, really find anything related to my degree I couldn't really find anything to be honest in uh, May of 2008 so started looking into teaching English abroad I actually had a friend who was in Beijing and it seemed like a cool opportunity because I already had a friend who was there so he had a little network of friends. He knew the city kind of well. And the Olympics were going to be there. So ah. figured, you know, worst case, I go check it out, climb the Great Wall, see the Olympics. And if I hate it, I come home. Uh, <laughs> I ended up staying the whole year. And then, like Rachel said, took her back with me a couple years later. And, yeah, she, she kind of filled, filled you in on all the in-between there. But one reason that we actually came to Puerto Vallarta, interestingly enough, is as we were planning our trip into Mexico, we were back in the States visiting. And... I noticed something funny. I had a little lump in my mouth. And my dentist, I went for a checkup in uh, my hometown. And my dentist said, oh, you definitely need a root canal and a crown on this tooth. And I was like, oh, great. You know, I just left my uh, life in Asia. I'm just visiting. I don't have any insurance for this kind of thing in the U.S. I'm well off my parents' plan. So I call up an endodontist and ask about appointments and cost. And, oh, wow, it was, it was going to be uh, quite destructive to our plans <laughs> so it wasn't urgent i wasn't in pain and so i started looking for well where can i get this taken care of in mexico you know i'm gonna need a couple of weeks so we were kind of planning on you know taking advantage of our new digital nomad status we were working online and let's go here and there for a week and we're gonna move to all these different places and um we started off that way but uh as i had to deal with this dental woe you know uh google pointed me towards puerto vallarta for the abundance of English-speaking dentists here and the affordable cost. So we ended up booking a place for a month so I could take care of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've heard this story before. We <laughs> loved it here. And one month turned into three, then it turned into seven. And we're currently on our third stay here of four to six months. So Okay. So uh, when you are here, 
you are doing your online work. Both of you have different online jobs, I hear? Yep. Okay. Well, we both teach English online for the same company. It's called VIP Kid. It's based in China. So we're still teaching Chinese students just from Mexico now. And then we have our own lifestyle and travel blog that we run. And then Sasha does some other stuff. Uh, I do a freelance writing for several other blogs. So ours is called Grateful Gypsies, if anybody wants to check it out. And we mostly write about um, teaching English, both in China and online currently. Um, we write about digital nomad life and our travels as well. And then I write for a couple other blogs. Some of them are based on language and culture. Others are helping people to live overseas. And others are uh, travel-focused guides to cities, things to do, itineraries and uh, stuff like that. So oh, that's great. So that's mixed that's, bag. That's all on your website? Uh, yes. All right. Fantastic. Our website has a big mix of stuff. And um, I've been writing for four or five others for the last couple months. So. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, that seems to sounds like it keeps you really busy. How does uh, how does teaching English to Chinese kids pay? It pays really well. Like we live a very comfortable life here in Puerto Vallarta. You know, we get to live in a place up on the hill with an ocean view. Um, I have to point out that we're low season people. Yeah, <laughs> the four to six months that we're here are uh, the hot and rainy ones. Uh, cowards, yeah. both all, both of you, cowards. <laughs> hey, we're, we're we're braving the heat in the storms. <laughs> oh, um, you're here during the stormy season. Yeah, we're here oh, in the low season. I take it back. I'm oh. so sorry. We oh. get yeah. out of dodge before everybody shows up in November. Yeah, uh, we're low season people yeah. because it's we just less got crowded. back here. It's May now, and we just got back. Okay, so where were you before? Uh, you got back from where? So we tend to bounce around. This is, has, been, has been our strategy since we relocated to this part of the world. We've liked PV so much that we set up shop here for a couple months at a time and get into a routine, work a lot, join the gym, uh, make friends, and go out and explore. And then with the rest of the year, when we're not here, we go home and visit family and friends. We go see live music, which is still a big passion of ours. And we travel to other places the last two years, it's been around Latin America, primarily. So. Yeah. We met at a music festival, so a lot of our travel plans revolve around live music. Live music. Yeah. Any particular kind of live music you guys prefer? We're big fans of the Grateful Dead. Ah. And Fish. And Fish. And Fish. So and you like you do the trolley dance, don't you? Oh, yeah. We ah, all right. Excellent. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Sometimes. When, we when the music the really moves you. We twirlers twirl. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't partake that's in the part, twirling. You know, that's part yeah. of the fun. Okay? It is. <laughs> it's a lot of the, we're actually headed to a music festival tomorrow. Yeah. We're heading so. back to the States tomorrow to go to a music festival this weekend. Ah. It'll be our third summer. No. Fourth in fourth a row. Fourth in a row. Yeah, summer Camp Music Festival. Yeah. Ah. Oh, wow. Central oh. Illinois. I'm actually working there in their media team, so it's not not just for fun, but it's pretty much just for fun. It's yeah, <laughs> I oh, use well. the term work very loosely there. <laughs> but this particular yeah. stint, when we were away, we've been back in Vallarta now for three weeks. Three weeks, yeah. Um, we left in October. Uh, I went to Columbia, the country, for a conference. He went to the States and saw music. We met up and saw more music together. Then we were at his house for November in Michigan, my house in Tennessee for December. Then we hit the road again in January and we spent the first six weeks of the year in Playa del Carmen. And um, then we went to Costa Rica. It's about two weeks. About there, two and a half, two weeks. half weeks in Costa Rica. And then Rica. we spent a month in Guatemala, primarily for the purpose of watching the Easter processions in Antigua. Ah, uh, wow. That must have been something. It was really cool. Was it? Was it yeah. pretty cool? Yeah, it was, it was really it was amazing. Awesome. You, you like, suggest, you don't have you to be... Oh, yeah. I would highly recommend it. And you don't have to be religious to enjoy it. Like, it's really just a cultural experience. Because it's one of the biggest Easter celebrations in the world. I think it is the biggest now. They have about a million people. I just wrote a lot about it for our blog and for the language blog I write for. And I was doing research. And they say, they say a million people come there every year. And it's a pretty small town. So it's, it's pretty, kind of impressive how many people show up and how many people are involved. And we wanted to go two years ago, but we kind of got stuck here, which Your wasn't a bad thing. Dental issues. My, de my kept dental us issues here. kept uh. us here a little longer than we had planned, and we missed it yeah. two years ago. Uh, so we finally got it together to check it out this year, and it, w it was great. I highly recommend it. it with uh, Valeris Airline too, you can fly direct from Mexico City to Guatemala City, and it's pretty affordable yeah so All i would right. just recommend if anybody tries to do that to plan in advance because a million people do 
descend upon this small city, and it can be hard finding a place to stay. All right. So, so you're there to like to witness uh, the the whippings and the uh, and, and and the nailings and they don't the, they don't really uh, go don't do that? The, all that. No, they have these no, big altars. Not that intense. Uh, they, they have these big these. altars that have scenes from the Bible okay. on the altar, but they're huge and okay, they can so, weigh so, several tons. So they're not they're they're not going all uh, you know all, what, what is it all Manila on us? No, right? they don't. You know, we they, did see that last year in Arequipa, Peru. Though yes. they, they reenacted they the whole Passion of the Christ. Peru, yeah. Wow. It was pretty intense, and there's little kids there like on their mom and dad's shoulders eating popcorn watching watching like, this guy playing jesus getting like whipped and there's fake blood everywhere and it was it's pretty intense the ones in antigua were much more uh, family friendly I okay guess, oh I okay uh, who knew i know <laughs> <laughs> all right um when we're talking about let's go back to like teaching uh, sure because there's a lot of people that live in this town that are always looking for somewhere something to do some work and uh, if you aren't Mexican, you can't work here. Right. That's uh, yeah. so. Give us an idea of how hard it is to to do what you do. Um, well, it depends on your your country of origin and your qualifications, really, because there's a lot of different options for teaching English online right now, but most of them are only for North Americans, and a lot of them do require a college degree. It can be whatever. We're both liberal arts degrees, but any you know showing that you have a degree. But then there are some companies that don't require you to be North American and they don't require a degree. So it really depends on which company you're going for. But Rachel's more of the expert on this than I am because she's uh, launched a course specifically about teaching online. So Okay, so how, do, pe- how, do, people get, how do people get that course? They can go to courses.gratefulgypsies.com. And that's our, that's our online school. And we have a couple of different courses. Right now we have a full course that's called Teaching for Freedom. And that takes you through like identifying what you could count as teaching experience because a lot of these companies have a pretty loose de- definition of teaching experience. It could be a number of things like having been a camp counselor, doing training in your corporate job, you know, anything along those lines. Then it takes you through, I teach you the different skills that they look for in online teaching because it's a bit of a different beast from teaching in the classroom and it's a different skill set. So I teach you how to do that and then there's a very robust section of the course all about what I think are the best um, online English teaching companies for traveling. The best companies for the purpose of taking them on the road, living abroad and I have videos walking you through the application process of each of those companies. And I'm even adding more companies to the course as I learn more about new companies and get familiar with them and make contacts with them. That's, a, that's an important thing for me with this course. I make sure that they're hiring and that I can have at least a contact of someone who works there or, at the very least, know someone personally who teaches for them who can vouch for them. So that's really like the core of the course. And then the rest is about how to make your schedule based around your travel schedule and how to kind of make this whole digital nomad lifestyle work as an online teacher. Because teaching online is not quite the same as doing like client work online that you can kind of do at your leisure, like when you feel like it. It's, you know, you have classes that are at a time and a place and you need to be there. And so it's... It can be a little tricky working it out with your travel schedule. And so. you do need pretty fast and reliable internet. Right. Which we've found has been, hasn't been a problem for us so much here in Puerto Vallarta. We've been here now for well over a year in total, and we've lived at a few different places, and we both teach online, and we haven't had many issues. But when we recently returned three weeks ago, the same place where we stayed last year, by the way, nothing's changed. The service was so much worse, and we were both having technical issues in our classes. It took five calls to Telmex to finally convince them that they had to come over and bring us a new modem, a new modem that it wasn't a problem with our computers. It wasn't something like this. It wasn't and, a problem with the configuration. Right. So they did finally come and change it out. And since it's then, it's fine. been totally fine again. Uh, yeah. okay. So it's, it, you know, those are things you have to be very aware of. And when you're moving around, you always have to check with your hosts if it's Airbnb or whatever to give you the internet speed and tell you the location of the router and that can be tricky so that's why we like staying here you know for several months out of the year just to 
put ourselves at ease a little bit and know that we can get quality time uh, spent working. And then when we travel, we don't work as much, but yeah. we do still keep it up when we're on the road. Well, so for people who are living here, you know, as long as you have a reasonable uh, internet plan at your apartment and uh, it's not shared with too many other people, it should be fine as far as speeds and consistency goes here. Puerto Vallarta has the infrastructure to be able to do this online. So Sounds good. What's your charge for your course? Two hundred ninety nine dollars. Two ninety nine. Yes. And for two ninety nine, you can learn how to help Chinese kids learn, which is pretty cool. Well, uh, the good you, thing about getting into teaching online yourself is, if you do get hired up with some one or two of these companies, then you have your own unique referral link, and you can be the one who turns around and refers your friends and uh, former colleagues or whoever about it. And if they get through the process, you get a bonus. That's so, right. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to make that money back. So it's really more of an investment than anything else because even if you didn't get another person hired through your referral link, you you would make that money back after one full week of teaching. Excellent. Yeah. So to give people an idea, you had asked about pay, and uh, we can give more specific figures in saying it's good for some of the top companies in China that do online English teaching, which they're honestly the best ones, the Chinese ones like VIP Kid and... That's who uh, we teach for. We teach VIP for VIP Kid. Kid. And I will mention that we have a separate course specifically for getting hired with VIP Kid because okay. that's the one that we know the most about. It's the one that we teach for. And if you are an American or Canadian with a bachelor's degree... It's where you should go. That's yeah. where you should go. They're the best in terms of pay and flexibility. Because it, it, you basically can make up to... I forget what the ceiling is. It's 22 to $24 an hour, I we think. We average $25 an hour. Yeah. But you can even earn more by... Uh, having short notice bookings and having these bonuses. Oh, yeah. and There's lots of ways to make more money on top of your solid. base pay. And you don't have any minimum hours or anything. It's, it's up to you. you got to be aware that China is 13 or 14 hours ahead, uh -huh. depending on the time yeah. of year. So that right. can be tough. You're up with the roosters. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Or you're, you're giving up Friday or Saturday night here and there to work some extra hours. We do that while we're here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's Port of Ireland. Sundays are fun, too. You don't need to go out in the... Friday or Saturday night necessarily. That's right. So sometimes we stay home and we'll, we'll work a couple extra hours at night. But generally we're up at 5.30 and teaching from 6 to 9 this time of year. And we're not really here in the high season kind of because of daylight savings time. And we would be teaching from 5 to 8. So that's why we went over to Playa del Carmen this year because they don't change the clocks there. <laughs> that extra hour of sleep really helps. Interesting. I don't yeah. know. We're not sure if we would trade off. I, I, we like Puerto Vallarta much more. Yeah. So the extra I'm hour of sleep was say, nice, but for the record, PV way better than Playa del Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> and the extra hour of sleep was nice, but given the choice, next year I'd probably just stay here. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Good. Yeah. Well, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move away from uh, our uh, our teaching and let's move into the city. Let's talk a little bit about because you spend a lot of time here. Tell us about. Um, now, I know you, you got your own place, so you're probably all, oh, I cook at home. But I want to hear what your favorite breakfast, lunch, and dinner places are. So who wants to start? Well, that's easy for me. I just wrote a blog post for one of the websites I'm currently writing for about best places to eat in PV. And I used TripAdvisor to see what other people think. It wasn't all my ideas, but I did go with some of my personal favorites. And so I, we honestly eat breakfast at home most of the time. But if we're going out for breakfast, it's probably Freddy's Toucan, which is a block from where we're sitting right now, right yeah, here at right. Kelly's, and the place is always great for breakfast. That place is great, but I'll, I'll say that if you prefer sort of a higher-end breakfast place, you should go to La Palapa. If you want to enjoy a really good breakfast on the beach that's more of like a fine dining kind of experience, that's where you want to go. I haven't really been nice. there yet. Rachel went when her parents were visiting, and I was out of town. What'd so. you get when you went there, uh, Rachel? You remember? I'm pretty sure I just got like chilaquiles because that's my go-to Mexican uh, breakfast. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Nachos yeah. for breakfast. That's what I call them. That's right. Nachos <laughs> for breakfast. That's right. right. How about lunch? What do you guys What do you guys like for lunch? Um, I like this little restaurant over here in the Romantic Zone that Rachel turned me on to. Uh, Dianita, is it, right? Yes. So it's a good menu del dia spot, and they're super friendly. It's always different items on the menu. It's very cheap for how much food you get. You eat that and you're good for a couple hours. So for us, if we're, you know, working a lot, or, you know, writing a new guide or something, you need to go somewhere that you can fuel up for a couple hours and not break the budget. So and, and we usually work from the uh, either via to co-work over here or one of the cafes around here. So it's mm -hmm. nice to be able to you know, walk somewhere quickly for lunch. Yeah. 
All right. I also really like Mai Kai Poke Bowls. If you want something a bit lighter and just more refreshing, um, they just showed up in town last year, I believe. They're only like slightly more than a year old, and it's a. It started out as a street food cart, but now they've made like a little restaurant, and they, their poke bowls are just delicious. Spicy really? tuna all the way. Yeah. I could eat that thing every day. You know, they're right next door to a breakfast uh, stand. Have you ever had breakfast over at that place? We never really are down here for breakfast uh, because of our tell hours, you. you know. If you ever go there, I mean, right next door, there's, there is a, you know, there's a taqueria, you know, cranking out hot cakes. And oh, it's, it's okay. very, you know, wow, this is cool. One of these days, I got to just finish my classes and, and run down the hill and catch the bus to town. I'm I'm usually, you know, all right, all either right. taking a nap or going to the gym after after classes in the morning. It depends on how uh, draining they were. Sometimes it can be tiring. Really, really. Hey, come on, don't tell people like that. They're, they're going to say, "Wait, that sounds like work." Well, I mean, we we also just don't like to go to bed early. We're uh, not good at going to bed so early. So if and we then if we could go to sleep really. at ten, we'd uh-huh. be fine. But we're always up past midnight, and then I get up four or five hours later, uh, teach for three it. hours. Oh, you then do it to yourself. That's I what's do. Going on. I do. Coffee helps, but oh, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of charged. napping here. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot. I, I, I've embraced the siesta part of uh, the local culture. Absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. All right. We have to go to dinner spots. Yeah, now, we then. haven't gotten dinner. Let's let's talk about that. Um, honestly, we eat a lot of tacos in the street here. Uh, it there's really so many great. Get much better than that. There's so many great spots. We've been trying to find new ones that we haven't been to. Trying to go, go to the ones that we love. We're over in Cinco, and uh, we particularly like Latia Mariscos. Yeah, I mean, the seafood in Puerto Vallarta is great, and they have ceviche, aguachile. Marlin tacos, shrimp burritos. The Marlin everything. tacos really just Marlin stand tacos. out above everything else. They make the Marlin in this like soy butter sauce, and then they put their own like chipotle sauce on it. It's so good. And it's a great local wow. place. It's very reasonably priced. Um, if we're going to go somewhere like fancier, like a date night, or now it's restaurant week, you know, a lot of restaurants have those awesome deals out. I think some of my favorites have been uh, Orion was really good. El Orion, yeah. I believe is the name. Yeah, that one's really good. Um, for, for Mexican fare, but uh, yeah. kind of creative, a little different spin on traditional Mexican dishes. Una or Familia is really good. Una Familia is pretty solid, too. Yeah. I'm trying to go with more local places. You know, like we don't, we don't eat a ton of pizza here or go out for Italian or stuff like that. We do love Asian food because we used to live there. Right. And uh, there's a few places in town that have opened up since we got here. Including uh, Budai Shi, which is in Versailles. It's, in Versailles. It's, it's legit Taiwanese food. It's fantastic. It's worth worth the trip over there if but you're living in That's not really dinner. I feel like that's no, more that's of a, a good lunch, lunch spot. But, but I'm, I'm just but saying. Let me tell you, the, the, yeah. you know, people want to know, so right. that's really good. I love those uh, those suggestions. Uh, any other any kind of hole in the walls? Hole in the walls. Um, like something that yeah. was like you walked into and it was just a big surprise. Hmm. That place we ate at next door to Latias. Yeah, there's was a, really good. So up there's on Calle Honduras, uh, in our neighborhood, we just noticed since we've been back, there's a couple new spots, and one of them it really looks like a hole in the wall. I don't even know what was there last year, but now they got a couple of plastic tables and chairs in there, and a pretty simple menu: gorditas and flautas and tacos dorados. And yeah, we dropped in there the other day because it's brand new, so it's nice to try new spots, especially around where you live and it was awesome and super cheap i don't remember the name though i'd have to send it over to you okay well when when you think about it you'll do that and i'll put it in the blog post and we'll have links to all these places and uh you'll find them at www.portofartotravelshow.com uh for this episode and uh i'll have pictures of sasha and of rachel in the blog post so uh make sure that you take a look there you'll find that and I'll also have links to all of their, um, you know, all of their classes and stuff like that. So just make sure that if you, you know, if you want to start like working in paradise, <laughs> <laughs> you might, you just might want to look into this. I think it's really cool. What kind of advice would you give to a first time visitor to Puerto Vallarta? Hmm, to a first time visitor, it's never been here at all. I would say I always tell people this when they're planning a trip here and you know, they're looking for places to stay and stuff now some people love the resorts you know especially the all-inclusive ones where they don't got to worry about anything i honestly think for your first time here it's kind of silly to stay in one of those because you do spend a good amount of money for the food and drink part but then you're missing out on what i think is maybe the best part about living here all the awesome restaurants and the taco vendors in the streets and don't all the be cool bars the here food. yeah just to go check all that stuff out so 
Uh, it's kind of hard when you're staying in a resort. So I, I don't know. I guess it really depends on the person. But I usually say it's better, I think, to stay over here in Old Town or even in Cinco de Diciembre where we are. And, yeah. Uh, you know, walk around, you know, hop on the local bus. They're easy to figure out. Eat at the uh, places with the menu del dia or the uh, taco vendors in the street and just embrace this part of Puerto Vallarta that really makes it great. And then exploring, right? Yeah, just walk around. Find all the street art. It's everywhere. And it's in places that you wouldn't expect it to be. Walk up to the cross. Uh, you know, talk to the local people. Ask them where they like to eat. Most people here speak English. Um, people are always happy to give recommendations here. They're, yeah. they're always thrilled to tell you about where they like to go. And Don't ask a taxi driver, though. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it might work out, it might not. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sorry, all of you taxistas out there. I'm really sorry. I, I take it back. You're not all that way. You know, all going, okay, I dropped him off at your door. You know what that means. But also, I would say, as far as exploring goes, you know, it's, it's great here that you can uh, hop on the local bus and get all the way up to, you know, Sayulita or all the way down to uh, Mismaloya or Boca and you do so for a dollar or two. And it doesn't take you that long. Yeah, so all these all these other towns around here are very very interesting. And definitely take the yeah. local bus. It's it's well worth it to, you know, even get off the, get out of your beach chair for for a couple hours and go do something like hike over to Las Animas Beach or that's a great hike. Just go walk around Bucerías. I mean, there's all these awesome towns around here, and it's great how easily accessible they are. I mean, it's it's I'm always amazed at how easily. And comfortably, you can travel around here for so cheap. Yeah. I mean, then we go home to the U.S. and where we're given the option of Greyhound or Amtrak, and they're both you know, overpriced and uh, they underdeliver. So it's it's really nice to have that option here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you were going to leave town for a day and uh, come back that day, where would you go? If you want to stay around the beach, I would suggest either going to Yalapa, taking the boat over to Yalapa, or going up to Sayulita. But if you want to kind of get elevated and get to cooler climates, San Sebastian del Oeste is a really nice day trip. Yeah, excellent. My, my vote would probably go for heading down to Boca de Tomatlan there and either uh, booking a spot at the what is it, Ocean Grill, and, th- and they'll take you on the boat over there. And just, you know, if, if you're not up for the uh, hike or getting sweaty, you can just enjoy a nice lunch there. And there's a pretty secluded beach over there that's good for a swim. But if you are up for the challenge, you can hike all around the coast there, go uphill a little bit. You go past some pretty cool resorts, some pretty much totally deserted beaches. And then at the end, you arrive in Las Animas there and a couple of restaurants there where you can grab a sun lounger and a drink and then catch the boat back to town or back to Boca. I think that's a great day trip. It's not too exhausting and uh, you can easily do it by bus, on foot or catching the water taxi. So you don't even really have to spend that much money to do that. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun, especially on a nice day. Yeah. It's, it's little... Yeah, don't yeah, don't don't go when it's hot because Yeah, that's the that thing. Is we're is always here hot. in the summer and yeah. there's some days are just there's really hot and rainy. Just, so. Yeah, it's it, it's oh, that humidity will will just nail you when you're on that trail. But that's that's been my go-to when we have people visit. Yeah, and, and if we're going to take a day off work, we'll go do that with them. So Las Animas so. is fa- fantastic, and it's also really nice to go spend a day at the botanical garden. Oh yeah, that's a cool spot over there too, and another place you can get to on the on the bus. On the bus. So. On the bus. Yeah. <laughs> on the old Tubito bus. They they can be a little uh, terrifying as they're uh, you know speeding around the curves on the mountain road but well you know what <laughs> they're used to it they've so. got new buses going up there and that's pretty cool i you know usually when i hop on the el Toledo bus you know it's got the one with the broken front windshield oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh the, you, you know that you're you're in and you know the seats are falling apart well i got on one the other day and it was brand new and it had reclining seats and it Ooh. was just beautiful it's, so yeah, it's pretty amazing we just took an air-conditioned bus down here so yeah that's yeah. it well <laughs> see <laughs> It's progress. It is. It's, what if you're gonna great. go? What if you're gonna leave town for three days? Where would you go? I would go to Guadalajara. If, probably Guadalajara. Yeah. yeah. All right. What do you do when you go to the Guad? Uh, I would recommend going on a weekend so that you can check out Chapultepec, and that's the name of a street in Guadalajara, and it's a really big street, like a 
boulevard and the middle of the street is like a that's where the sidewalk is and it's a really wide sidewalk and on friday the fountains and, and yeah lots of benches fountains. And it's really beautiful and they light it up at night and they have on friday and saturday nights a lot of vendors who come out and they're selling art artisan soap um all kinds books yeah all kinds it's, of it's stuff it's like a really cool night market and then on sunday they block the street off for five or six hours to motorized vehicles and it's all cyclists rollerbladers dog oh, yeah. walkers people playing volleyball in the street it's just a very festive atmosphere and my number one vote is to go see the lucha libre fights there in guadalajara they do them on tuesday nights that's the party night and then sunday is a more family friendly uh, affair it starts a little earlier all but right. e either one is awesome all right what's a lucha libre come on what is it? Lucha Libre is a Mexican wrestling where most of the wrestlers wear masks. Um, it's very high flying. They'll they'll do uh, backflips out of the ring, and it's usually uh, three on three matches for the most part. It's very entertaining. Lots of high flying acrobatics. Yeah. Like, oh wow! How cool Sasha's is that? Sasha's a big fan of I like WWE, WWE back home. wrestling yeah, in the so. states, which I think is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I like Lucha Libre. It's really okay. cool. Oh, very good. Well, you're way too young to remember Freddie Blassie. So oh, no. I, I remember all the legends. Oh, you do. My, my uncles got me into wrestling when I was really young. Uh, and then I got younger brothers, and that, that's something that I kind of took over, and I started taking them to shows, and, all right, and we so, still watch it together. But So why is it that Mexican wrestlers wear masks? It's part of the tradition for Lucha Libre. I'm not specifically sure uh, wh why it started that way, but... Um, you know, it's always been kind of a big point of honor for the wrestlers, the, the style of their masks. They put, you know, their own flair into the design. And, you know, some of them take it so seriously that they won't take them off in, in public. Remember, there's the story of uh, El Santo, I think. He's the most famous luchador ever. And he took his mask. He, he would wear it in public. He was so famous. And he, you know, maintained this this lucha luchador identity yeah. even out in public but like, like he the took, lone ranger yeah he yeah. took it off at one point for something he was on a tv show or something and, and he uh, had passed away untimely like a few weeks later so it's kind of like this weird juju of may maybe he was cursed for taking his mask off but then they actually buried the guy in his mask <laughs> so i mean it's it's such a big part of the uh, of the wrestling here and I, i've bought a couple of the masks myself because it's, it's really fun. If you go to the match in Guadalajara or Mexico City, they sell them out front. And, yeah. It's really disrespectful for them to try and take off the masks, right? right? Yeah, the bad guys always try to take the masks off because that's, that's super disrespectful. Yeah. Ah. So usually they keep them on. You know, yeah. yeah. They, they tease that they're going to take it off. But oh, well, it's part of the show. It's a lot of fun. I love it. I mean, right. it's, it's fun for the whole family <laughs> on Sunday. Tuesday can be kind of rowdy in Guadalajara. You can take this party bus there. And yeah. It's uh, mostly you know younger people people who are out to party and it's not really a thing to take your kids to on tuesday night but sunday night there it's it's cool it's an extremely entertaining experience yes, it's, and it's <laughs> so cheap i mean i go to wrestling shows at home with my brother and we spend hundreds of dollars and we go to guadalajara or mexico city and spend 20 bucks for ringside seats it's fantastic yeah no kidding do you take selfies of yourself and send them back to your brother and say ha 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 <laughs> I, have, I have sent them um, they want to come check it out one of these days Sasha's I, been known to do that yeah yes. they don't really have the fights here in Puerto Vallarta so my, I had two of my brothers come to visit here but uh, we just focused on Puerto Vallarta and we took them up to Sayulita uh, okay. so you know they were here on vacation so we, yeah. didn't, we didn't take them over to the city but it can't all be wrestling all day yeah. that's with, just the way it, it with is with a couple of days I think it's really cool to go to Guadalajara or Safe? Mexico City if you don't mind the fly how about the safety over there in Guadalajara I've never felt unsafe, honestly. But then again, I don't. I'm always with Sasha. It it might be different for solo female travelers, but I feel like as long as you're staying in like the main populated areas and and just don't walk at night, even if it's like a short distance. Yeah, Uber's there. Take an Uber. You know. Take a cab. Just don't walk by yourself at night. But as far as like walking around within like you know the popular area where a lot of people are, I think that's fine. Okay. You, you so you you will find yourself. Looking around and saying, "Toto, we're not in Puerto Vallarta anymore." That's definitely very different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's much busier. And but aside from the night market, there are a lot of art museums. There are a lot of hipsters in Guadalajara, so there's a lot of really like hip, cool, eclectic areas. Lots of breweries, lots of lots of cool coffee cafes, shops. Yeah. cool coffee shops, stuff like that. And the theater there is beautiful. I actually went for the uh, mariachi festival last year. Yeah. They do a mariachi oh, festival wow. in September. I yeah. think it is. So they have a lot of free shows in the main plaza and then in shopping malls and other parks around the city. 
but they have these gala performances in, in the theater right there in the center of town. And the theater is just gorgeous. It's, it really it's is. It's well worth the ticket just to go in and see the building. And then you know, they have these very impressive mariachi bands in there. And they had a whole like orchestra playing with one uh, on the night that I went. So that was a really interesting thing to be a part of. It's popular, so those tickets kind of tend to go fast. Mm-hmm. But I, that's the cool thing about Guadalajara that I miss. Like, we used to live in a really big city in Beijing, and I love Puerto Vallarta to live. It's great, but I do sometimes miss those big city things, these you know big festivals. And uh, they, we saw Cirque du Soleil in Guadalajara last time we were there. So yeah. there's a lot of cool stuff. Just I would check the calendar if you plan a trip there because there's probably something interesting going on. Music, sports, uh, cultural things, whatever, all throughout the year. Nice. So, Very cool. Pretty wow. easy to fill three days. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. Especially if you're into the um, into the wrestling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Let's come back. Let's come back to talking about what you do again. Tell us how we uh, find your website once again. more. Our website is gratefulgypsies.com. And then we're also Grateful Gypsies on all the social media. We have a Grateful Gypsies Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube channel. And I would highly suggest people check out our YouTube channel because we've recently sort of started our own video podcast. And it's a our, work in progress. It's a work in progress. But Trying our, something new. Yeah. Our first full episode is totally focused on living in Puerto Vallarta and why we love it so much. Nice. All right. And you'll be able to find that on your site? Yeah. It's yeah. on YouTube. Oh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. It's on YouTube. Right. I'm pretty sure. You, it's, got, you, it's, you got the YouTube channel then. It's yep. same same name. It's, it's yes. on our Facebook page somewhere, too. I, I do believe we've shared it in the uh, big Puerto Vallarta Facebook group once upon a time. But. We also have a full blog post on the website about the cost of living in Puerto Vallarta, and that video that I mentioned is inside that blog post. Excellent. All we right. just kind of tracked our expenses for a month, maybe, I don't know, and, and tried to write a post showing people how much we spent on getting around, which you know we mostly take the bus now that... Well, I also compared two different areas of the city, because the first time we lived here, we lived in... Um, Aralias, which is a more residential area, more inland. Mm-hmm. And it's a then, short walk from PTL. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. Yeah. So we lived there for the first six months we were here, and then we moved into moved Cinco into the big de city. Yeah. Diciembre. Right. So our costs obviously went up. But yeah. yeah. So I also compare the, the costs of living out there to living in a more central location. Excellent. That's exactly what people are looking for. All right, well, I'm going to have links to all those in the show notes. And like I said, Sasha and Rachel are going to have their smiling faces in the blog post, so make sure you check that out. And uh, I just I want to thank you both for coming and, uh, and sitting with me up here on the rooftop here at Kelly's Port of Saloon and Cookhouse and uh, enjoying the buses as they go by. <laughs> it is and a nice rooftop to hang out on. We've yeah, been yeah. here before to see music, but we've never been up on the roof. No. Yeah, well, you know, so. I... I, I, I asked her, and she said, sure, go on up there. So yeah. they cleaned up for us and everything. So um, once again, thanks for coming on, and uh, thanks for letting me introduce you, too, to, uh, to the Porch of Arctic Travel Show and to my listeners. Thank you so much. Yeah, we yeah. definitely appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. All right. How interesting was that? What a lot of great information, right? I mean, who knew? All that cool stuff about Mexican wrestling. All right. Um, I have links uh, to the Grateful Gypsies. I have their website right there. All the information in the show notes. Um, And besides the classes they provide, they also have some other great information on that website. So just go there and check it out. But wow. Tell you what, I'm dusting off my credentials right now. How cool would it be to make that move to paradise and teach the Chinese how to take over the world? Wait a minute. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, <clears throat> uh, check out the pics and the links and let me know what y'all think, okay? Okay, well, that should do it for this week. Uh, next week, stay tuned for more on the ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, with travel tips, great restaurant excursion ideas, and more. But until then, remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions, of course, about all things Puerto Vallarta. If you think of something that I should be talking about, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and send us your message. And remember, if you're considering booking any type of tour while you're in Puerto Vallarta, you must go to vallartainfo.com, that's JR's website, 
and reserve your tour through him right from his website. Remember, this is a value-for-value value proposition, my friends. His experience and on-the-ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta in exchange for your making a purchase of a tour that you would do anyway. You're just doing it through him as a way of saying thank you. Thanks, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you're going to use someone else, so just do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me about your experiences. Maybe you can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off a message. And don't forget, he's got his maps, his DIY tours, his revitalized happy hour board, and more. And I have links to all of those in the show notes. And once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time and subscribe and give me a good review on iTunes, if you would. That way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And remember, I made it easy for you to do just that with each episode I create. But if you haven't been to my website, you really need to have a look there. I have links to all the places that we talk about, interesting pictures and more right there in the blog post and in the show notes for each episode of the show. So check them out for sure if you haven't, all right? All right. Uh, thank you, Neil Gerlowski from uh, Vallarta Botanical Garden. Make sure you visit the garden next time you come to Puerto Vallarta. Uh, maybe even take their special tour. Be pampered, right? And thanks so much to Sasha and Rachel, you grateful gypsies. Thanks for talking with us and thanks for spreading the good news about how you can become a grateful gypsy and a digital nomad and ditch that rat race for a job in paradise, wherever, of course, paradise happens to be. For you, that is, mm, like Puerto Vallarta, right? <laughs> sure it is. Hey, thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. This is Barry Kessler, signing off with a wish for all of you to slow down, be kind, and live the Vallarta lifestyle. Nos vemos! Amigos Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de amor junto al mar Yeah, yeah.